Hello and welcome back to Obcast. Today we're going to talk about ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. The goals will really be just to learn what this is and what we can do about it. Now, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, first of all, it's a complication of fertility treatment. Now, an example of fertility treatment would be in vitro fertilization, but there are other types. But how this condition arises is that the ovaries in this process are stimulated. Women usually take FSH injections, and this increases the amount of eggs and therefore ultimately embryos available with each cycle. Now what occurs is these stimulated ovaries, when they're exposed to luteinizing hormone or beta-HCG, in the latter, whether a pregnancy occurs or they have a HCG injection, the can have a production of vascular endothelial growth factor and other pro-inflammatory cytokines which ultimately lead to vascular changes and third spacing. And the third spacing really accounts for the majority of the clinical syndrome and that is third spacing into the abdomen, into the chest, into the peripheries and giving women an edematous or effusion based state with the addition of being intravascularly uh, deplete. Now this is an uncommon presentation. It can happen in up to 20 per, uh, 1 in 20 assisted fertilities, but the truth is these women generally have a close working relationship with their fertility specialists and most of these cases are managed as an outpatient. So it's uncommon that you'll see this in the emergency department or your clinic, but you need to have a suspicion about it and that's because it is uncommon it's generally treated by other people and it presents, as you'll see in a moment, reasonably non-specifically. So most of these symptoms are attributable to the third spacing that occurs and women can present with abdominal bloating or discomfort, nausea and vomiting, leg or vulval swelling, reduced urine output from the, from the fact that they're intravascularly deplete and then they can be breathless and this really can have a variety of causes, causes depending on severity and that might be a pleural effusion or the fact that the diaphragm's pushed upwards from tense ascites. They could have a pulmonary embolism because this can be a pro-thrombotic state or they could even have in a severe end um, stage have acute respiratory distress syndrome. So the breathlessness itself can be uh, due to a variety of causes. It's worth talking briefly about some investigations these women might get. They usually get a basic blood panel. Deranged LFTs are interesting and worth seeing. Um, CRP in some centres is used as a marker of severity, but it's fair to use other clinical parameters and we'll talk about some of those in a moment. Um, ultrasounds are often done. It can be of the abdomen to look for and mark for drainage of ascites or even just to quantify the size of the ovaries because these things can be quite massive or to screen for ovarian torsion which can occur due to the abnormally large size. Now in terms of the severity of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, there's never been an agreed set of criteria, but the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology in the UK have published their way of stratifying the severity. And I think it makes sense and I think it's reasonably easy to follow. And so I just thought I'd pop that up. It's important as non-obstetric practitioners, we have a good understanding of the more severe end and if you can see there, the principles are that we have really large ovaries, some electrolyte abnormalities and hypoosmolality, and then tense societies or a big effusion, hemoconcentration in the form of a significantly elevated hematocrit, reduced urine output or evidence of complications such as thromboembolism or ARDS. And I'll just stress again, this is the vast minority of women that will get a more severe um, manifestation of this syndrome. We'll talk briefly about the management. Now the take home point is it's largely supportive. The first step really is just to defend the intravascular volume and typically that's with fluid administration. Um, it is preferred for fluids to be given orally as opposed to intravenously if possible. There's not much of a role for colloid so it's mostly crystalloid therapy and there's very, very few reasons or times in which you would give diuretics. So usually this is just fluid administration. Other aspects of supportive care include oxygen as needed, in some cases ventilatory support, analgesia and antiemetics. 
and then considering and managing complications. Now, a common procedure that's done is paracentesis. Now, this is typically done transabdominally, has been described transvaginally, but this is not commonly done. Indications for paracentesis really are severe, distension, pain, or shortness of breath or respiratory failure secondary to the ascites. And then the last indication is oliguria despite appropriate fluid administration. And the reason here is a bit like abdominal compartment syndrome. The thought is that by reducing intra-abdominal pressure, the renal perfusion pressure may improve. These women should be given VTE prophylaxis and really considered whether they may be presenting with a venous thromboembolism and that should be investigated and treated if that suspicion is there. And otherwise, just considering ovarian torsion if a woman is presenting with severe pain, especially if it's unilateral, remembering these very large ovaries are, you know, at risk of twisting. Now, finally, in terms of risks to the pregnancy ongoing, there isn't actually an increased risk of miscarriage in these women. Um, it's r incredibly rare that these women need a termination of pregnancy due to symptoms. It's really just in later pregnancy where the complications increase and the, the only consistent associations out of observational studies have been just a, an elevated risk of preeclampsia and preterm birth, which needs to be considered during their ongoing antenatal care. So that's all I wanted to say about ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. I wanted to keep it brief and reasonably straightforward. Uh, thanks very much for listening and I hope that was helpful.